taxpayers' dollars we've witnessed over the last nine years. And lastly, as one of the three appropriators that are liaison to the Intelligence Committee, I note that the bill fully funds the President's requested funding increases for intelligence gathering activities at the Department of Homeland Security. I support the bill and yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose the gentleman from Alabama rise? Uh, I yield uh, two minutes. Did the gentleman from North Carolina seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I would ask to continue to reserve. I uh, yield two minutes to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Dent. The gentleman from Alabama yields two minutes to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Dent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of H.R. Uh, 2017, the Homeland Security's Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2012. As we all know, we're closing in on the 10th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. And this week marks the one month, uh, one month since the uh, death of Osama bin Laden. And communities across the country, uh, particularly in Alabama, as ably represented by the chairman of this subcommittee in Missouri, are reeling from some of the most devastating storms and tornadoes in their history. I'm pleased that the Homeland Security funding uh, bill is the first of the, of the FY12 appropriations bills to be considered on the floor this afternoon. H.R. 2017, this legislation tackles both fiscal discipline and national security, uh, both of critical importance to the American public. Uh, with regard to fiscal responsibility, H.R. 2017 provides $40.6 billion in discretionary funding, or almost uh, $3 billion, or 7% uh, below the request. 1.1 billion or 3 percent below the fiscal year 2011 uh, level. As for national security, all of our frontline personnel, including Border Patrol agents, CB CBP officers, uh, ICE agents, and Coast Guard military uh, personnel are, are fully funded to sustain their forces and meet mission objectives. Obviously, we wish we could do more in this legislation, but I think this is a very important start. We should move this process forward. Furthermore, uh, 2017, this bill, 2017, uh, does not shy away from oversight to ensure the federal government is a good steward of the American public's tax dollars. For instance, the Transportation Security Administration, TSA, will be required to cap their full-time screeners and generate a plan to improve the integration of screening technology and the deployment of its existing workforce. Uh, having served on the authorizing committee for six years, I very much appreciate this initiative and have worked, paid very close attention to these TSA issues over the years. I do believe that this bill we are considering today is timely and specifically targets our nation's security needs, and I know that we're going to have a robust debate on some of these amendments that can further enhance this legislation. Uh, finally, I want to thank Chairman Adderholt for his hard work and his leadership as well as the minority staff, and this time I yield back the balance of my time. Time of the gentleman from Pennsylvania has expired. Gentleman from Alabama. I'd like to recognize uh, uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. King, for two minutes. Gentleman from New York, the Chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, Mr. King, is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman from Alabama for yielding, and uh, let me just at the outset commend him for his professionalism and his courtesy throughout this entire process, and also for the effort that he uh, made to uh, preserve the Secure the Cities program in the Homeland Security Bill. Having said that, I must reluctantly oppose the bill as in its current form. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman, uh, the threat level is the highest in our country since 9-11. That has only been increased since the death of Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden specifically stated, we find in his documents, that he wants to attack mass transit, wanted to attack maritime shipping. Yet we are reducing our mass transit security funding by 50 percent. We are reducing our port security funding by 50 percent. We are reducing overall aid for Homeland Security grants, which was the purpose for which the department was created, we're reducing that by 50 percent. This, I believe, is putting us at risk. I can speak, for instance, from New York. We have five million people, five million passengers every day in our subway system, hundreds of thousands on the commuter lines, yet we're cutting security by 50 percent. We have a thousand police officers working on counterterrorism, carrying out a federal purpose, doing not what they were doing before September 11th, but working entirely, entirely on counterterrorism and intelligence. Yet their funding will be significantly cut. We have the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative, which is going to provide a camera system of protection in the Lower Manhattan area. And I can go through pro a program after program, every penny, every penny is accounted for. And I would say that uh, 
as, as we go forward, as we look to the future, it's important that cities and governments have some sense of continuity of where the funding will come from as they put their programs in place. To have a 50 percent cut this year is going to put us at a severe disadvantage. And as we do approach the 10th anniversary of September 11th, do we really want to cut our police departments, our counterterrorism units, our intelligence units, our mass transit uh, security, our port security by 50 percent? To me, this is an invitation to, uh, to an attack. Uh, we cannot put ourselves in that position, and because of that, despite my great regard for the chairman, I must reluctantly oppose this uh, legislation. Time of the gentleman from New York has expired. Gentleman from Alabama. I reserve. The gentleman reserves balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe we have no further speakers, so I yield the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose, gentleman from Alabama, rise? Oh, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. All time for general debate has expired. Pursuant to the rule, the bill should be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. During consideration of the bill for amendment, the chair may accord priority and recognition to a member offering an amendment has caused it to be printed in the designated place in the congressional record. Those amendments will be considered read. The clerk will read. Be it enacted, the following sums are appropriated for the Department of Homeland Security for fiscal year 2012, namely Title I, Departmental Management and Operations, Office of the Secretary and Executive Management, $126,700,000. Gentleman from Ohio. An amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Could the gentleman send his amendment to the desk? I'd be happy to. Let me take this up in a minute. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. LaTourette of Ohio. Page 2, line 10, after the dollar in the amount, insert... The chairman asks unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Is there objection? Without objection, the amendment is considered as having been read. The gentleman from uh, Ohio is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. I, I thank the chairman very much. First of all, I, I want to indicate that I'm offering this amendment with my friend and uh, neighbor, actually. He's in the office next door, Mr. Pasquale of New Jersey. Uh, and this deals with the uh, Fire and the Safer Grant programs. I also want to indicate that I have nothing but respect for the full committee chairman and the subcommittee chairman who have been dealt a uh, difficult hand with the 302B allocations made in front of them and as they face the awesome responsibility of uh, funding the programs that defend our country. However, the chair, I think, may remember during the discussion of the continuing resolution in H.R. 1. Uh, that there was some discussion about what funding levels were appropriate for fiscal year 2011 uh, for these two grant programs which aid our first responders. In the one iteration of H.R. 1, there was something along the lines of a 70 to 75 percent reduction uh, from these funds. Uh, those funds, however, were restored by overwhelming uh, votes of the whole body. Over 300 members uh, supported Mr. Pascarell's amendment uh, to put the level back up at $820 million for fiscal year 2011. And uh, just shy of 260 members supported Mr. Price of North Carolina's amendment that dealt with uh, how those funds could be utilized and spent. Now again, faced with the difficult decisions that the, uh, the chairs find themselves in, uh, the average reduction, and this isn't, this isn't a bill that came to the floor with across-the-board cuts, but the average reduction in spending is about 14% uh, for the bills that the Appropriations Committee is considering. Yet these funds uh, have gone 
from the $820 million to $350 million, which is on the order of about a, uh, a uh, well, 60 percent reduction. The amendment that I offer with Mr. Pascarell would uh, transfer funds out of the Office of the Secretary and Executive Management, the Office of the Undersecretary for Management, and the Office of the Chief Information Officer to restore those funds not to the $820 million that uh, 300 members of the House indicated should be spent in the last fiscal year, but restores them to $670 million, equally divided between the two programs that I've indicated. Now, at that level, uh, these funds will still receive a 19 percent reduction from fiscal year uh, 2011. And again, citing my great respect for the chairs uh, of the committee, on more than one occasion I've heard it remarked that this is a national uh, homeland security bill uh, and there needs to be some nexus between this funding and a national purpose, that we should not be in the business of funding every local and or volunteer fire department uh, in the nation. And I agree with that sentiment. However, I can just tell you that faced with amazing budget pressures uh, back in our local communities, when the Grand River in Painesville, Ohio flooded a couple of years ago, uh, it wasn't FEMA, it wasn't the Coast Guard, it wasn't uh, the National Guard that plucked these folks out of their, their homes and plucked them out of the river and saved their lives and saved their properties. It was our firefighters and our police officers. And so if we make a determination as a Congress that we are in the FEMA business, that is emergency management business, and we will provide funds to help rebuild and reshape and fortify and all the other things, then we need to be in all parts of the emergency management business and that includes the first responder portion of that. Therefore, I know that uh, uh, we have attempted to come to some agreement on this amendment uh, to try and uh, get all parties on board. Sadly, we haven't been able to do that, not for lack of trying on part of the chairman. Uh, but we find ourselves now with this simple amendment that transfers funds from the bureaucracy of the Department of Homeland Security and restores it to our local communities and our first responders. So again, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank Mr. Pascarell for his co-sponsorship, urge support of the amendment, and yield back the balance of my time. The balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I rise to reluctantly uh, oppose the amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, as I mentioned, I reluctantly rise to oppose this amendment, uh, which would uh, slash the funding for the department's management functions below what is responsible for the nation's security and move funding uh, to the grants. Uh, I was hoping that we were able to work something out on this, but it was not possible. But the committee has already cut the department's headquarters management at historic levels. In fact, the bill reduces the funding for these activities 21 percent, what the president requested himself. This includes we have zeroed out the department's new headquarters in Washington, D.C., zeroed out the funding for the data center migration, and we've slashed other initiatives we cannot afford at this time. Many of these cuts were unavoidable because the president's budget request for the Department of Homeland Security was filled with phony offsets. Since 9-11, Congress has provided $6.7 billion for this program and for the last three years has included a waiver for the cost share requirements with local governments. Given our nation's dire fiscal situation, we must uh, take a stand that uh, it's not the federal government's job to bail out every municipal budget or to serve as a fire marshal for every city and town across the nation. Uh, in today's physically constrained environment, the $350 million that we have included in here is a lot of money. And again, while I support the gentleman's intentions, uh, I would urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment. I yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Other se members seek recognition. For what purpose the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Chairman, please uh, strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. The chairman, first I want to thank uh, Mr. LaTourette, as usual, taking on a very, very exquisite subject here and not coming late to the fight. So I'm proud to rise in strong support of this bipartisan amendment. I want to thank my good friend from Ohio for his leadership and willingness to work across the aisle 
on this important issue. To those who say that the federal government bears no responsibility about public safety, they are absolutely wrong. On one side of our mouth, we say that we must protect and defend our first responders. On the other side of our mouth, we say that we have no responsibility whatsoever and talking about our firefighters and our police officers. And that is why, just a short period of time ago, in the 2011 CR, both sides came together. The majority of both parties supported putting money back into the budget. We're debating a bill called the Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. It's an ironic title because this legislation, as written, fails the American people and fails the very people who are on the front lines of our homeland security. It is our firefighters and our police officers who will respond to a national tragedy before the federal government. This is what we said in 9-11. This is what we said in every year since 9-11, and it has not changed. We understand the financial realities this country faces. And I'm prepared to work across the aisle to find common solutions, as we did six months ago. But what we cannot afford is to sacrifice our country's security at the altar of spending cuts. And that's precisely what the bill, as written now, does. The fire and safer programs, these programs, supported by both Democrats and Republicans, reached across the lines, across that center aisle that goes down between us, and said, let's work together on the national security of this country. Remember, the FIRE Act was written before 9-11, when places in the far west had to push their equipment to a fire. Simply put, that's not acceptable in the United States of America, the greatest country in the world. And when we asked our first responders to be ready to, to protect us to protect the community, we need to know that they have the resources necessary. And as you know, not only in the past several years have our local communities been unable, small and large communities, to have all of those resources at their hands, but now it's even, even more difficult. What you're asking here is a cut of 57 percent compared to the 2010 and the 2011 budget unacceptable. I support adequate funding for all of the ag agencies funded in this bill, but we're short changing the very people who ran into the burning buildings on September the 11th. You can't tell me those folks weren't on the front lines that day. I don't believe you if that's what you're telling me, and I know you don't mean that, but then don't say it. The FIRE Act was signed by President Clinton before September the 11th. We're talking about basic equipment needs for our fire departments to protect all of our constituents. And hasn't that changed since 9-11? What their responsibilities are and what they need to respond to is much different than before 9-11. September 11 changed the relationship we have with our first responders, solidified our decision that no longer would this funding be a solely local issue. Firefighters and police officers are an integral part of Homeland Security, and ensuring they were well-staffed and equipped would be, a, be partly a federal responsibility. Since they were originally authorized back to 2000, these programs have provided nearly $7 billion to our local fire departments in nearly every congressional district in this state, in this country. The fact is that our firefighters rely on this funding for the equipment, for the training, to the personnel, especially in these tough economic times. An independent evaluation of the fire program, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Speaker, published by the U.S. Fire Administration, concluded it was highly effective in improving the readiness. And this is the most efficient federal program in the entire federal budget. Time Hear me. The time of the gentleman has expired. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman yields back.
Gentleman from North Carolina. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last words. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise in qualified support of the uh, latter at Pasquale Amendment. The bill before us more than halves the total amount of funding for firefighter assistance grants compared to 2011 and 2010. If this bill is adopted as written, the hiring grants, known as safer grants, are going to be cut by 63 percent below 2011, and equipment grants will be cut by 51 percent. That is simply unacceptable. These cuts would result in thousands of fewer firefighters on the job. It would leave fewer departments able to maintain safe staffing levels. It would prevent many fire departments from purchasing equipment, purchasing breathing apparatus, and protective gear that, are, that our firefighters uh, depend on during a time of emergency. This bipartisan amendment provides $320 million to restore this funding to the President's requested level. Mind you, that's still below the 2011 level, but it comes at least to the President's requested level, and it would divide the funds between safer and equipment grants, as we've been urged to do by the various fire associations. Retaining this funding when local governments are cutting firefighter budgets will help preserve public safety and security. This amendment will help keep thousands of firefighters uh, on the job. And the notion that uh, we're talking here about some kind of federal uh, takeover of, of local security responsibilities, uh, I think uh, everyone in this chamber knows that that is, um, is not an accurate characterization of what's going on here. Of course, these expenditures are, are still mainly occurring at the local level. But we're in a world where our fire departments are being asked to equip themselves in new ways, to train themselves in new ways, to meet new kinds of threats and hazards. And these fire grants, the personnel grants and the equipment grants, have been a critical way of establishing a partnership whereby our local fire departments can do what they need to do in, the, in this new uh, era uh, as, when, when they confront all kinds of, uh, of new hazards. Now, I don't believe the offsets in this amendment are workable at the end of the day. I want to acknowledge that. But the inadequate Republican budget allocation combined with the decision to transfer $850 million from first responder grants to disaster relief and to refuse emergency designation for disaster relief leaves my colleagues no good place to cut, no, no good options to, uh, to find offsets for these absolutely essential uh, restoring of, of these grants to firefighters. So I support the amendment, but I'll work diligently to restore these these uh, funding cuts uh, as the bill progresses, and, and we'll get down at the end of the day, I trust, to responsible budget negotiations with the Senate and the White House. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas rise? To strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Well, Mr. Chairman, I rise to support the La Tourette Pascal Amendment. And I, too, uh, recognize the challenges that Mr. Adderholt and Mr. Price faced in the confines of trying to address some difficult times. But as a member of the Homeland Security Committee, I believe it is imperative that we look at the reality of the world in which we live. A letter dated, an article dated April 24, 2011, out of the state of Texas reads, hundreds of weary firefighters were racing against the clock on Sunday, pushing back massive brush fires that have destroyed near wrecked swatches of Texas countryside. Firefighters were hoping to make as much progress as possible before low humidity and strong winds set the stage for more potential flare-ups late Monday and Tuesday. Fires are still burning uh, in Texas. Firefighters are still being called upon. Cities and states across America are laying off firefighters. And we're reminded of the needs, if you will, 
that were addressed on 9-11, when firefighters from the city of New York rushed in to save their fellow New Yorkers and others, and many of them, many of them perished. They are, in fact, first responders. And I believe it is important that we make the sacrifice. We find the adequate offset, and we support this amendment. I'm also reminded of a story that many of you may have heard. It's a sad story. It aired on local television, where firefighters from some locality watched while a man drowned and could not save him. The reasoning was that the particular team that would have had the skills and the equipment to save this drowning man in what has been called the most powerful nation in the world was fired, laid off, eliminated, and therefore from the shoreline many looked in horror as this particular man drowned. Is this what America's come to? I believe this amendment is extremely important. One, to be able to show appreciation to the firefighters across America who come to the aid of those in need from different states when a crisis or tragedy occurs. I heard someone mention, it might have been Mr. Tourette, that who is it that plucks you out of a burning house or rescues you when they do have the resources and the team out of a predicament uh, where you are stranded in some crisis, whether it is drowning, whether it's a fire, whether it is a, an emergency health condition, or whether or not they're confronting a terrorist act, firefighters are truly our first responders. In the city of Houston, they're considering closing out or shutting down 600-plus police officers, and firefighters have the same concerns. So I think it is very important that we own up to our duties, and as I mentioned in a metaphor before, let the American people be winners today. Let the firefighters be present and accounted for. And let us be reminded of their great heroic acts of 9-11. This 10th year and anniversary, let us not say thank you in the way that we deny them funding, but let us say thank you in the way that we provide them with the funding that they need. I ask my colleagues to support this amendment. I yield back. Back the balance for time. The, uh, for what purpose, the gentleman from Michigan rise? Uh, mo um, move to strike the last word, Mr. Chair. The is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I support this amendment as well for several reasons. Number one, it's very obvious. Our first responders, our firefighters, uh, they're the first there to uh, take care of the public when a national, natural disaster such as uh, these uh, tornadoes that have hit our country um, uh, demolish homes and injure people. But most importantly, it's this. Our local units of government right now, they don't have the money to properly equip and staff their firefighters. And here's why. Their property values that they, de that they depend on for their funding, well, they've been diminished because of the foreclosure crisis, a crisis that this Congress has failed to effectively address. So there's one duty, however, that we can't turn our back on, and that's the safety of the American people. And that's why I urge you to at least partially restore funding for these important firefighter grants. And while I may have a problem with the funding source of this amendment, I'll tell you the appropriate way uh, to fund our first responders and firefighters and police officers and emergency medical providers. Take a share of the military aid that's going to Afghanistan right now. Bin Laden is gone. We need to reassess our mission in Afghanistan and redirect some of that money to protect Americans right here at home. Let's put some of that money in the Homeland Security budget. It's our firefighters that are first defense against a terrorist attack. I support this amendment. We have the money. We just need to allocate it right. We've done enough in Afghanistan. Let's take some of that money and put it right here to protect the American people, support Homeland Security, because the next threat that we likely will get from a terrorist will come from within our borders. Let's take care of our people right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield my time. time. The question occurs, uh, for what purpose the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to strike the last word. 
Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the La Tourette Pascrell Amendment to the Homeland Security Appropriations Bill to restore funding for the assistance for firefighters and staffing for adequate fire and emergency response grant programs. The AFG and SAFER programs are essential to our public safety and security. These programs improve the readiness of our nation's firefighters, ensuring that the brave men and women who put their lives on the line every day for the safety of our communities are prepared with the equipment they need to continue protecting and serving our communities safely and effectively. These grants provided by the AFG and SAFER programs are the single most important source of federal assistance to volunteer fire departments. They help fire departments equip, train, and maintain their personnel so they are prepared to respond to all emergencies. These programs are able to address the immediate and individualized needs of fire departments efficiently and effectively because funding is awarded directly to fire departments instead of being funded through other layers of government bureaucracies. As a result of the recent economic downturn and budget constraints at all levels of government, Many fire departments have been forced to cut personnel and services. Without adequate funding for AFG and SAFER, thousands of firefighters could be laid off and communities across the country could be put further at risk. There are more than 150 fire departments in my district alone, and each one plays a critical role in keeping local communities safe. Many of these fire departments have benefited from AFG funding. Beaver Falls, Hanover, New Brighton, and Raccoon Township Fire Departments are just a few of the many that have used the grants to purchase new equipment or train additional personnel. Just this year, Berkeley Hills Fire Department used an AFG grant to purchase an aerial ladder fire truck that will help the department better protect the numerous multi-story apartments and complexes, retirement homes, and businesses in Ross Township. The West Deer Township Volunteer Fire Company also received an AFG grant last year that allowed the fire company to replace outdated equipment with a new portable radio and automated external defibrillators. These upgrades will not only increase firefighter safety, they will improve the services provided to the communities those fire departments serve. Enacting the grants to the AFG and SAFER programs in the underlying legislation will only make it harder for fire departments to avoid layoffs and protect our communities. By adequately funding AFG and SAFER programs, we can help volunteer fire departments nationwide obtain the equipment and personnel they need to effectively respond to emergencies. According to the International Association of Firefighters, over 1,600 firefighters could lose their jobs as a result of the funding cuts that are in this bill. I urge all members to support firefighters in their districts and vote in favor of increased funding for firefighters and support the amendment of Mr. La Tourette and Mr. Pasquale, and I yield back my time. Back, uh, the balance was time. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you for allowing me to speak in support of the La Tourette and Pasquale amendment to restore funding for fire and safer grants. I'd like to thank Congressman La Tourette and Congressman Pascrell for offering this amendment which enjoys bipartisan support, which I strongly support. The onslaught of natural disasters that we have seen over this across the country have shown that the need for first responders has increased, not decreased. Many of us have been strong advocates for this program and recognize the inherent value of making sure our nation's first responders have the people, and the equipment that they need in order to ensure our safety in all of our local communities. I support these programs. Why? Because they work. After an independent evaluation of the fire grant program was implemented by the Department of Agriculture, it concluded, it concluded, the Department of Agriculture, that this program was highly effective in improving the readiness and capabilities of firefighters across the nation. Additionally, at a time when many, local state, when many local and state governments have been forced to make drastic cuts to their emergency staff and personnel, the SAFER program has been the only resource fire departments have had to ensure that their communities would be ready if they needed to respond. In the Appropriations Committee report, it mentions that FEMA should maintain all hazards focus in order to ensure that FEMA concentrates its efforts on where it is needed most.
I strongly agree that this sentiment, which is why I think this amendment is critical to achieving our goals. As representative of the 37th Congressional District and ranking member of the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Emergency Communications Preparedness and Response, I understand the importance of having a fully staffed and equipped fire department. The San Miguel Fire, the worst wildfire in California's history, burned through 90,000 acres of land and cost $15.6 million. However, thanks to prior planning and fire prevention education efforts, it made possible that with this critical grant program that not a single life was lost in devastation. Therefore, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Unfortunately, with firefighters, it's not something we can always plan ahead for. We have to be ready to respond, to do the rescue, and then to do the recovery. It's because of this that this amendment should be found in order to eliminate the burden that our local state governments and the firefighters feel of having to do more with what they can't do with less. I yield back the balance of Chairman my time. Gentleman yields back the balance for time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Ohio. Those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Pin the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes, uh, for purpose, Mr. the Chairman, gentleman from Alabama rise. Ask for recorded vote. Gentleman asked for a recorded vote uh, pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18. Further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Ohio will be postponed. The committee. Uh, gentleman will suspend. First, does the gentleman from uh, Rhode Island rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Cicilline of Rhode Island. Page 2, line 10, after the dollar amount insert reduced by $1 million. Mr. Page Chairman, five. I ask unanimous consent that we suspend the reading of the amendment. Is there objection? Without objection, the amendment will be considered as having been read. The gentleman is uh, recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment is offered by me, along with my colleague, Mr. Langevin of Rhode Island, Ms. Matsui of California, Ms. Berkeley of Nevada, and Mr. Ellison of Minnesota. I rise to offer this amendment that restores funding for state and local grants, which includes funding for the urban area security initiatives, which, which is referred to as UASI. This bill makes dangerous cuts to the urban area security initiative, this, the UASI program, a program critical to the security of cities that have been deemed at high risk of terrorist attacks. One of those cities is Providence, Rhode Island, and my congressional district, along with more than 50 other urban areas in our country. Just last year, the Providence area was one of 64 cities with either critical assets or because of geography that were identified by Homeland Security experts as being most at risk of being targeted by terrorists. As a result, the city of Providence and other communities across this country have received critical federal funding under UASI to support efforts to prevent and respond to terrorist attacks and other emergencies. As a result of this, Providence also became the first city in America to have an accredited emergency management and homeland security department. However, the cuts that are proposed in this legislation will cripple the ability of cities to effectively ensure proper safety should an attack occur. The elimination of these UASI city means that staff will not be able to attend critical training, maintain certifications, or purchase equipment necessary to be prepared. Thousands of devices like security cameras and radios, projects such as port sirens and watercraft will not be able to be maintained. Emergency operations centers will not be able to be constructed or maintained. These are urgent, urgent priorities for America's cities. Mr. Chairman, we cannot in good conscience spend billions of dollars protecting people all over the world at the expense of our own national security. I urge members to adopt this amendment. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman and yield yields back the balance of his time. My colleague from Rhode Island, Mr. Landman. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman yields to uh, the gentleman from uh, Rhode Island, uh, Mr. Langevin. Excuse me, the, the, the gentleman from Rhode Island, the uh, author of the amendment, must remain on his feet during the uh, yielding of time. Gentleman is recognized. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I want to echo uh, his sentiments. I rise in support uh, of my joint amendment with Congressman Cicilline to restore $337 million to the Urban Area Security Initiatives Grants Program, which would fund the program at the FY10 level. 
Now, in my home state of Rhode Island, a counterterrorism fusion center, regional cyber defense measures, and chemical, biological, and nuclear detection assets support response efforts across southern New England. Now, a level one trauma center and the Port of Providence are also critical assets for the region. These homeland defense capabilities are in jeopardy, however, due to the cuts to the Urban Area Security Initiative a grant program in this bill. The URC grants were specifically designed to make sure that densely populated areas with critical assets were adequately funded and protected. Now, because of the cuts in this program, this is an example of what I believe are an irresponsible and arbitrary approach to budget cutting that jeopardizes safety throughout the region in case of an attack or natural disaster. So I applaud my colleague and look forward to working with him on this issue. I urge my colleagues to support the, the Cicilline uh, Lange of an Amendment. And uh, I yield back uh, the, the uh, balance of my time. Mr. Chairman, I yield now a moment to Mr. Ellison for a, a request to uh, put something on the record. Unanimous consent. Unanimous, unanimous consent to submit a statement for the record in support of the Cicilline Amendment. Without objection, the uh, gentleman's statement will appear on the record. And, and I yield a minute to Doris Matsui, the gentlelady from California. The gentlewoman is uh, recognized, and the gentleman must remain on his feet as he controls this time. Gentlewoman from California is recognized. I, I move to strike the last word. Uh, excuse me, the, the, uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island controls the time. If the gentleman yields back the balance of his time, the chair will recognize uh, first the chairman of the subcommittee and then... I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. gentleman yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to this amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, the bill before us today was born out of a need for reform. It consolidates various grant programs and provides discretion to the Secretary. These reforms include funding reductions, requirements for measurement, and requirements for spending languishing dollars. In total, this bill provides $1.7 billion for Homeland Security first responder grants. However, as we are all aware, not all programs are funded at the previous year's level. The, the consolidation in this bill forces the Secretary to examine the intelligence and risk and put scarce dollars where they are most needed, whether it is port, whether it's rail, surveillance, or access and hardening projects, or whether it's high-risk urban areas or to states, as opposed to reverse engineering projects to fill the amount designated for one of the many programs. Additionally, as noted by the gentleman from Rhode Island, the bill limits the Urban Area Security Initiative grants to the top highest, 10 highest cities. Again, this puts scarce dollars to where they're most needed. This does not mean lower risk cities will lose all funding. It will just mean that funds will come from other programs such as Homeland Security grants that are at risk and formula based. These cuts will not be easy, but they are long overdue and necessary to address our out of control federal spending. Furthermore, the offset proposed by the gentleman is unacceptable. A reduction to the border security fencing infrastructure and technology account would, number one, impact operation and maintenance on the border fence. Number two, reduce investments in critical border security communications. And third, affect the Border Patrol's ability to procure pre proven technologies to increase border security immediately. I urge my colleagues to support physical discipline, and I would urge a no vote on this amendment. One yields back uh, time. Uh, for what purpose, gentleman from North Carolina, the ranking member of the subcommittee, rise? Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, let me state it very plainly. We need to increase funding for urban area security grants, UAC grants, to a minimum of the 2011 level of $725 million. I offered amendments in full committee and asked for a waiver from the Rules Committee in order to do just that. Now, the majority has uh, taken over $2.2 billion in these grant programs, has consolidated them into a block grant of $1 billion. If you take that $1 billion that includes all these state um, and local grants, and then you reduce this for the statutory carve-outs, and then you reduce it again, assuming the minimum statutory funding for the states, what's going to be left? There's going to be only half a billion dollars left for UIC, 
for ports, for rail, for transit, and for other key grants. Altogether, this is simply not enough. Unfortunately, the proposed offset is also unacceptable. This bill, just like the 2011 final CR, greatly reduced border security, fencing, infrastructure, and technology projects to secure our borders. While some of this reduction is due to a termination of the SBI net contract, this uh, proposed cut would uh, prevent CBP from acquiring off-the-shelf technology to support our border patrol along the southwest border, as well as to conduct pilot projects on our northern border. So the offset would be indeed a damaging reduction. But this simply illustrates the impossible dilemma posed by this bill. The root problem is an inadequate allocation, and it's compounded by the refusal to call an emergency an emergency. So I commend the gentleman from Rhode Island for his initiative to address the dangerous gap left by the majority's bill when it comes to protecting our nation's urban areas. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the question occurs on the, uh, for what purpose does the gentlewoman from California rise? Mr. Chairman, I rise to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise today in support of the amendment. The intention of this amendment is to restore funding to the Urban Area Security Initiative, or as we call it, UASI. In my district of Sacramento, California, funding from the UASI program has gone to critical counterterrorism initiatives giving law enforcement officials and first responders the tools and training to protect our community. Sacramento is the capital of California, the most populous state in the Union, and the seventh largest economy in the world. It is critical to continue to support the anti-terrorist work being done there, and it is unacceptable to leave this region without appropriate funds for protection. With potential targets like the Folsom Dam, which is upstream of the city of Sacramento, key transportation systems, and numerous state and federal facilities. UIC funding for the Sacramento region ensures protection from attacks and cooperation among local, state, and federal agencies. Not receiving UIC funds would devastate one of the nation's most proficient counterterrorist and readiness task forces located at the former McClellan Air Force Base in my district. This facility creates greater collaboration and communication among state and federal law enforcement and first responders. Mr. Chairman, this amendment will bolster our nation's security by giving our communities the tools and training necessary to keep us safe. I urge my colleagues to vote in support of this amendment and to yield back the balance of my time. Yields back the balance of her time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Rhode Island. Those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Pay the chair. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Mr. The Chairman, I re request a recorded vote. Gentleman from Rhode Island requests a recorded vote. Um, pursuant to, I got it here. Pursuant, pursuant Mr. Chairman, I withdraw the rule request. 18. Further proceedings. Mr. Chairman, I, I withdraw the request. The gentleman withdraws the request. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? I oppose the amendment. The, the, the chair just put the amendment to a vote of the House. Does the gentleman request a recorded vote? I ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Rhode Island will be postponed. Purpose is the gentleman from California, Mr. Royce Rise. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number two, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Royce of California. Gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate it. Uh, this is a... a Gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Uh, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. This is an amendment supported by uh, Chairman Lamar Smith, uh, Chairman of the Judiciary Committee. The reason he and I are in support of this is because this amendment reduces the office of the secretary and executive management account by one million and increases funding for immigration and custody to facilitate new agreements under the 287G program. And this bill, this amendment, will provide for uh, better enforcement of our immigration laws. 287G has been very successful. 
It allows state and local law enforcement agencies to cooperate with the, the Department of Homeland Security to enforce immigration law. It was enacted back in 1996, and Congress implemented this program to give local communities help with the illegal immigration in their area. A couple of points I would like to make, Mr. Chairman. There are maybe 5,000, 6,000 ICE agents in the United States. There are 650,000 state and local law enforcement enforcement officers. 650,000. So the 10 to 12 million illegal aliens in the country are much more likely to come into contact with local law enforcement than they are um, with an ICE agent. And for local law enforcement, it's important that they be properly trained so that they don't profile, don't discriminate but properly identify those here illegally who are breaking our laws. Now, there is a backlog of cities that want 287G agreements. And what this legislation does is, is uh, assist in covering that problem. One of the reasons so many cities want to be involved in this is because criminal alien gangs generally victimize people in the cities often are victimizing other immigrants, um, often victimize legal immigrants. And frankly, law enforcement should be trained in how to identify and remove criminal aliens. And this assists in that. It's a great force multiplier for ICE. It provides ICE with assistance such as following up on leads and performing investigative research and surveillance. It's had a positive effect on the workload. Uh, for ICE by identifying removable aliens, and it gives ICE greater flexibility in directing its immigration law enforcement resources. Now, I want to make another point here. The CBO scores this amendment as costing zero in budget authority. Also, I, I think we should reflect on the fact that given that one of the 9-11 hijackers, Mohammed Atta, was pulled over in traffic Two days before the 9-11 attack, there is a significant benefit to checking the immigration status of all individuals who are arrested. Had the officer inquired about Otta, he then could have found out that Otta was in the country illegally and may well have prevented his participation in the attacks. That is one of the benefits of having local law enforcement trained in this area. I also wanted to uh, make an additional uh, point. This brings tens of thousands of local law enforcement to help enforce our immigration laws. There are now 70 jurisdictions with these agreements, but many more communities want help. The 287G program also provides training to state and local police, giving them additional tools that they can use to prosecute crimes committed by illegal immigrants, especially gang violence and document fraud. Over the last few years, the open borders lobby has been successful in getting the administration to curtail the use of this program. Well, the 287G program is a solid improvement in terms of enforcing immigration laws, particularly with the gang activity that we have today, with the drug lords sending local gangs uh, across the border in order to participate in crimes here, it is very clear that we need this kind of a program. Uh, and before it was created, many illegal immigrants stopped by state and local law enforcement went free. Immigration laws were not enforced. Since the program was developed, it's helped the state and local law enforcement not only fight crime, as I've indicated, but to get the gang leaders, to get the serious criminals off the streets and enforce our laws. So instead of curtailing the program, we should be promoting the expansion of it. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and help local communities to enforce our immigration laws. Back the uh, balance back. of his time. For what purpose does uh, the question uh, is on the amendment uh, Mr. offered. Chairman, Mr. For what purpose the gentleman from North Carolina rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to this amendment. The bill before us provides full funding for the department's request for the 287G program, and $1 million more simply is not needed. Uh, the increase proposed by the gentleman comes at the expense of the Secretary for Homeland Security, an account which is already significantly reduced in this bill and will likely be reduced uh, further based on amendments that uh, we uh, have, have seen already. 
Further cuts in these accounts would eliminate key staffing positions, limiting, limiting the department's ability to respond to national emergencies, and to provide for stable leadership in the event of a large disaster or a terrorist attack. I should also note that uh, while this bill slashes funding for many worthwhile and needed homeland security programs that support first responders, it cuts homeland security research, much needed research, but the bill piles more funding on the immigration enforcement. In fact, it adds $28 million in unrequested funding for immigration detention and removal. Now, the bill provides full funding for the Secure Communities Program to continue expanding this program across the country, allowing Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, to identify criminal aliens who are in local custody. I bring up the Secure Communities Program because it accomplishes the objectives of the 287G program, but much more efficiently and without deputizing local police to enforce immigration law, a proposition that is rife with complications and potential abuses. So if we were really serious about deficit reduction and efficiency, we would tell ICE to transition out of this duplicative program, 287G, and to concentrate on making secure communities work efficiently and fairly and well to identify and remove convicted criminal aliens. I'd also like to note for my colleagues that GAO and the Inspector General have reviewed the 287G program, in some cases at our subcommittee's request, and they found serious flaws in the implementation of this program and in ICE's ability to oversee its operation in local communities. The IG found 33 major deficiencies in 287G last year and then, then found 16 more when it recently reassessed the program. So this is an unwise and unneeded amendment and I urge its rejection. Back the balance of his time. The question is on the amendment of the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Royce. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. No. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The on that, I request What purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Mr. Chairman, on that, I'd like to ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California will be postponed. Clerk will uh, read. Office of the Undersecretary for Management, $234,940,000. What purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 12, printed in the congressional record, offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. Gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, is recognized for five minutes in support of her amendment. Mr. Chairman. What purpose, gentlemen, from uh, Alabama? I, res I reserve a point of order on the gentleman's amendment. Gentleman reserves a point of order. Gentlewoman is uh, recognized. Mr. Um, Chairman, uh, I've served on the Homeland Security Committee tragically uh, since the formation of the Select Committee and then ultimately the full committee. For many of us who were here in the United States Congress and watched the planes attack the Pentagon and ultimately visited Ground Zero in the early stages are well aware of the need to protect America. As a ranking member of the Transportation Security Committee, working with my colleague from Alabama as the chairman, we well recognize the importance of transportation facilities uh, and modes. For some reason, terrorists are attracted to airlines and freeways uh, and trains. And so this amendment is a very simple amendment that I believe provides security to the American public. It was no doubt that after the killing of Osama bin Laden, discovered papers suggested that al-Qaeda operatives were considering attacking the U.S. rail system on the 10th year anniversary of September 11 attacks. Yes, it was 2010, but if we recall, we were unaware that we were going to be attacked on 9-11. Los Angeles MTA planned security upgrades 
in response to bin Laden's killing and discovery of rail attack plans. That is the American public's sensitivity, that we must protect our modes of transportation. My amendment is a simple amendment that restores $5 million to the Transportation Security Account at the President's submitted request by reducing the Office of the Undersecretary for Management and Transportation Threat Assessment and credentialing. Since the demise of Osama bin Laden, it has come to light that Al-Qaeda had ambitious plans to launch an attack against our nation's mass transit systems and their riders, our constituents. Now more than ever, we must ensure that our mass transit and surface transportation is secure by developing risk-based policies and programs that devote appropriate measures, appropriate resources to securing these systems against terrorist attack. This amendment would increase the surface transportation security account at TSA by $5 million bringing the account in line with the President's request for FY 2012. In Washington terms, $5 million may not sound like much, but it is a critical increase to the Surface Transportation Security Account at TSA, which has historically been underfunded. This account funds frontline homeland security personnel in the form of surface transportation inspectors with, who, in addition to reviewing regulatory compliance, consult with transit agencies and rail companies in improving security infrastructure and operational protocols. The American public, whether it's Amtrak or long-distance rail, need our involvement. We cannot afford to diminish the protection of our rail lines where grandmothers and grandchildren, college students, uh, commuters use. This is a smart investment at a critical time. Be remembered and be reminded, we got no notice about 9-11. And we will get no notice about attacks on our rail system. To fund this increase, my amendment simply reduces $2.5 million uh, from two different accounts. This is a wise decision at this time to help our communities and mitigate the terrorist threat that our local transit systems, as well as for improving security for passenger and freight rail, just be the communities that would be impacted by a horrific terrorist act, whether it is through the cities. Uh, through the neighborhoods of Houston, whether it's in Los Angeles or the Midwest. All of our communities and constituents are serviced by some form of surface transportation or mass transit. And as we have seen abroad, this mode of transportation is vulnerable to terrorist attack. From Spain to London, they know the truth, and we must stand vigilant, providing this increased funding for our surface transportation uh, inspectors is a wise investment on behalf of the American people and I ask my colleagues to support this amendment. Gentlewoman yields back the balance of her time. I yield back at this time.